Hi everyone, uh, welcome to a very special out of hiatus summer interview with Tori Bruno, the CEO of United Launch Alliance. Tori, welcome to the show. Thanks, Frazier. Glad to be here. All right. All right. Round two. I got the audio working. Apparently, if I don't use my computer for two months, uh, things change and I, I almost forget how to use them. All right. So, uh, well, the question I always ask people is, is who are you? What do you do? Oh, well, I run the United Launch Alliance, the premier space launch company that's put most of our assets up on orbit. I get to work with super smart people and be a part of a really exciting industry. Now, you have a long history with rockets. How did you get into this field in the first place? Oh, well, I was, I am old enough to have watched the first person walk on the moon live. And from that point forward, I was just hooked. A year later, I was building rockets out of old dynamite I found in the back of my grandmother's barn. And it's kind of the rest is history. How well does dynamite work as a rocket? propellant not that well actually <laughs> um, this was really old like 80 year old dynamite the nitroglycerin had sweated out onto the skin it was super unstable really really dangerous and here i am with wrought iron pipe i also found in the barn cutting this stuff open with a boy scout knife and pulling it out and jamming it in there somehow didn't detonate it and i'll tell you what some of my rockets actually rose into the sky before they exploded. <laughs> right, okay. Well, hopefully the, the goal is to not uh, to replicate that. Um, now, I was at the OSIRIS-REx launch and it like four years ago, and that launched on an Atlas V rocket, which is United Launch Alliance rocket. Now, I covered the mission, the spacecraft. We've been doing a lot of coverage of, of just what happened with the spacecraft in retrieving a sample from, from asteroid Bennu. But what did, what did I not see behind the scenes that sort of made that mission possible? Well, the first thing is... This is the culmination of a research team's life's work to get that mission off. And so many, many years in really intense science went on until it actually became a spacecraft and an instrument and got integrated on our rocket. We did a really, really special insertion for them, you know, in order to be able to you know, sort of have a healthy industry and be able to compete stuff. You write specifications to the lowest common denominator, if you will. And so there's an accuracy that they designed to that the spacecraft can then make up for. We like to pride ourselves in delivering more than that. And this was one of our better insertions. I mean, right on the bullseye. And what that amounted to is one of the things that the spacecraft wanted to do relative to like gravimetric measurements, for example, was turned out to be very difficult when they actually got there and they wished that they could do an extra orbit of the body, for example, to collect that science. And we made that possible with that accuracy. And so that was kind of a cool thing that you got from writing on an atlas is more science. We saw something very similar happen with, say, the launch of the James Webb Space Telescope. Now that was Ariane Space, but how much time we get from this space telescope that can never be repaired depended entirely on the accuracy of the launch. What kinds of, like what's considered a bullseye in this industry? Anything within that plus or minus error band is considered acceptable and most providers will achieve that, that outer circle most of the time. What's really, really unique is when you consistently deliver less than 10% of the error allowance, or even in some cases, as we do, literally 0%. Ariane did a great job on that mission. My friend Stefan Israel, who's my counterpart there, uh, he's, a, you know, he's a great executive, he's got a good team, and on that mission, they delivered a very good insertion. And so, yeah, we're all looking forward to the science that's going to come off of James Webb. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and so, you know, to follow on that, the launch of the Parker Solar Probe was on another ULA launch, and you seemed quite excited about what was accomplished with that mission. Well, that was a really cool launch for a couple of reasons. It, you know, it was our largest rocket, Delta IV Heavy. It had a third kick stage on it. 
because it needed that much energy. It was the, the well, is currently, in fact, now the fastest moving human object in the universe. It's doing over 400,000 miles per hour after its gravity assists. So that was cool, the uniqueness of it, the specialness of it. It was really special to have Dr. Parker there. He's the only person, living person, to have had a mission named for them during their lifetime. He was a rebel in the scientific community. This is the guy who said space is not empty. It's full of solar wind, and there's all of this activity on the sun and within the sun's sphere of influence. And everybody thought he was just crazy at the time, but he stuck to his guns. He was right. This is his mission. And then that spacecraft literally flies through the atmosphere of the sun. Can you imagine anything more exciting and more cool than that? You know, just groundbreaking science is already coming from that mission. So everything about it was cool. It was neat to have him there with us at 90 some odd years old to be on the roof. I got off a console. I ran up to the roof where he was to join him and walk him through the launch, you know, and there was maybe a little tear in the corner of his eye. It was just, it was a special mission all the way around. And, and, and by the way, oh, go ahead. another one where we delivered enough accuracy that if nothing else were to, to go wrong or to demand that margin from the spacecraft, it will allow two solar cycles, not one to be covered, literally doubling the science. Right. And it really does feel like the more propellant you can give the payload the more science it can it can work with and i mean we've seen these these missions go really until they run out of propellant that seems to be the limiting factor the the instruments keep working the the batteries keep working the you know if they're if they're using an rtg it keeps going it's just as how long can they remain in orbit at the place they want to be able to do do their science yeah, that is exactly right. That's generally the limiting factor for a spacecraft is how much of, it, of its own propellant it still has to do station keeping and pointing, the things that allow its instruments to do their mission. And that is what is left over after the spacecraft has to make up for whatever error was handed off to it by the launch vehicle. Now, you mentioned being inspired by the Apollo era. You saw the first people walk on the moon. I was wasn't born yet. Um, I guess for the last one, I think I was born for the for the last uh, walk on the moon. Um, but but how has has rocketry changed in the modern era compared to that day? And I want to give you sort of like a, I had this realization a couple of days ago, I was reading through some papers on NASA archives from the 1960s. And it feels like every idea that people are thinking about in modern rocketry was conceived of back in the 60s. They're all there, but the technology wasn't there, the miniaturization, the speed of computers. What's what's really kind of enabled the modern realm of rocketry? Yeah, all of that, and what a great perspective. I'll, I'll share with you, I'm, I'm a little bit older than you are, Frazier, and I've been doing rockets for a long time. So I, when I was first in an advanced programs, which is like a research kind of role, trying to invent things, and I would have still the old timers who were there from the Apollo program, and I would bring them something that I thought was very clever, and they would say, yeah, that's really cool. We tried that back here on this vehicle, but yeah. we couldn't get it to work because the materials couldn't take the environment then or because the computing power couldn't handle the instability of that kind of vehicle. So your idea might work now. Sorry, it's not original, but we might be able to actually engineer it today. And that's exactly what it is. It's material science. We have stronger, lighter, more heat resistant materials than we ever had before. The computing power allows us to do so much more with trajectories and vehicle flight paths than we could do before. And so the net result is, you know, smaller rockets can do more than we could do back in that era. In fact, even on Apollo, you know, having two burns on an upper stage was just insane. And today, you know, I can routinely do five burns, six burns on an upper mm. stage and do so much more complex orbital insertions, which are more efficient and allow us to do things we couldn't do back then. Yeah, it's, uh, that's interesting. I mean, I just think about the just the compute power alone, like is is a lot of that what is getting you those trajectories? 
It's the combination of being able to do the more complex flight path as well as the engineering and materials that allow the rocket engines to turn on and off in the just tremendously harsh environment of space hmm. and still be able to function and deliver very high performance. That's interesting. Um, all right, so let's talk about what ULA is is working with now. So, I mean, we are, I, I mean, I know that for the longest time you've been reliant on Russian engines and we've got the, of course, the Russian invasion of, of Ukraine, which is terrible for the people in Ukraine, but also is causing disruptions to the space flight industry around the world. I mean, it's been nothing short of catastrophic. Um, what, what impact is this having on ULA? Well, we're fortunate in that the impact on us is pretty close to non-existent. You know, there, there was a time when our country encouraged us to use the Russian RD-180 engine on Atlas in order to keep those Russian rocket scientists from scattering to places like North Korea and Iran after the Cold War. And that was the right decision then. But it's been pretty clear for a long time that that's probably not the thing we want to be dependent on anymore. So, you know, developing Vulcan moves us on to a domestic engine. But in the meantime, what about all these atlases we're flying out in parallel? Well, obviously, I did not foresee the specific invasion of Ukraine, but I was able to see this declining trend in the relationship between our country and Russia. And so the first instant I had that I could order ahead and receive early delivery mm. of RD-180s, I took it. And so I've had over two dozen engines at that time delivered early and stored in a warehouse in Alabama sufficient for the entire fly out of Atlas before that invasion occurred. And so when it occurred, we were largely unaffected. And those engines are, they're already accounted for. Like you have, you have plans for each one of those engines through yes, the, the Atlas program. To that, we have sold them out, out you know, bittersweet but yeah, Atlas is sold out yeah yeah um I was mentioning before we started someone was mentioning in the chat that we should improve our speed and use Starlink this is Starlink I am using Starlink and uh and so it would be nice to have some some competition who's who's buying those those remaining Atlases it's a variety of customers so the DoD has bought some and uh NASA has bought a couple and commercial customers like SCS and Biosat the, the last large block actually went to Amazon for their project Kuiper, which is uh, a competitor to Starlink, a proliferated LEO constellation and sometimes called a mega constellation, internet in the sky, and a pretty exciting capability. I can't talk about their numbers or their, their specific uh, performance yet because that's for them to do at the appropriate time. But I will say that uh, it's pretty cool, and I'm pretty excited that we can enable this capability that's coming. We actually saw a, Sky, uh, a Starlink train go last night past our right above overhead where we are, and my wife spotted. It was like, "Oh, Starlinks!" <laughs> and they happen so often; they just sort of like a surprise. And it, it'd be interesting to see the difference when the when the Project Kuiper heads off. All right, let's talk about Vulcan. So, what is the Vulcan? Vulcan Centaur. All right, the Vulcan is a single stick heavy capability. So our Vulcan, which you can see the other shoulder, this shoulder <laughs> is uh, got more lift capacity than a three core Delta four heavy. So that's pretty exciting. It continues to be optimized, not for the Leo mission, which is what Starlink and what Kuiper are, but actually for the higher energy, more complex orbital insertions. But one of the really cool things about our Vulcan architecture are those solid strap-on SRMs. Because one of the tyrannies of rocket design and space lift is payloads come in all different shapes and sizes and weights, and they go to different orbits, but the rocket is the rocket. And so every rocket's perfect for one mission, and it's kind of fixed, and then it's less than perfect for every other mission there is. But with those solids, in a way, we get to make our first stage bigger or smaller. That's why we do it. And then we continue to have the upper stage technology that we have on Atlas only sized up 
with even more energy, more than two and a half times the energy of a Centaur three in much longer duration than we have is present on Vulcan and it's Centaur five. So that means we can do all kinds of exotic things once we're in space, once we're in orbit. So it's a different kind of rocket. You know, when you're optimizing for LEO, you like that really big first stage and you want kind of a smaller upper stage. But for us, it's about that first stage going very high, very fast, uh, twice as fast, twice as high, almost twice as far down range as, for example, a Falcon rocket, because we're trying to save as much propellant as possible on the upper stage to do these complex orbital insertions, kind of analogous to the way we were talking about spacecraft a minute ago when we discussed accuracy. So it's not a better architecture, it's a different architecture optimized for a different mission, but with that flexibility. So we will be flying all of the kinds of missions we fly now, going to Mars, going to bodies that are like Osiris Rex, going to the sun as possible. I hope there's more solar hmm. missions. We have yet to explore really the poles of the sun. So we're really equatorial with Parker Solar Probe and Solar Orbiter, which we followed up with a little bit higher inclination, but the poles of the sun are, are largely still a mystery to us. All of those kind of missions we will do very well with Vulcan. And then for our LEO missions for Kuiper, Vulcan will be carrying 45 spacecraft per lift. And it'll actually have a variation, a different kind of upper stage to do that, a smaller one, believe it or not. When you're, like I said, when you're going to LEO, you don't need all that upper stage, but you'd still have to carry it. And sort of counterintuitively, that really big upper stage can lessen your performance to LEO. So we actually have two versions of that. So that's our Vulcan. Now we're very experienced with the traditional and the Atlas and the Delta. They launch, they various parts separate at different stages. The upper stage carries on and, and carries the payload to its sort of final orbit. How, give us an, sort of like a, talk us through how a Vulcan will fly and how it might be different. Oh, sure. So the first thing that'll happen is this really large rocket it's so much bigger than an atlas, so much more energy. It'll be sitting on that pad. It could be well upwards of two and a half million pounds of rocket with its payload there. We'll ignite that thing. You know, about two minutes in, these as many as six now, six solid rocket motors, over 120,000 pounds of propellant will be burned out. Imagine that tremendous amount of energy expended four and a half minutes in the flight, that first stage has been completely consumed. At this point, we are in space, traveling at very, very high velocity, but we're not orbital yet. Then we transition to this gigantic Centaur V, and a small portion of its propellant would take us into an orbital velocity. Typically, we are always going to go to a, what we call a LEO parking orbit first, so we're going to go to a LEO circular orbit, so that we can coast to be properly lined up with just the right time to begin our orbital maneuvers for where, wherever that spacecraft is going. You don't always see these circular parking orbits. We do them because we also have a special kind of steering that we call RAN steering that we're gonna execute during that first stage flight. For any mission that's going to space, there's an ideal time to launch, really an instantaneous launch window. In most vehicles, in fact, vehicles that are not ULA vehicles are really constrained to that, especially if they're doing a rendezvous type of mission like intersecting with the space station. And the reason this exists is because you're not launching from a fixed place. You know, when you're at Cape Canaveral, your launch pad is already moving 900 miles per hour. That's why we launch at certain times of the day, because yeah. the Earth has come around to be lined up. But with this special kind of steering, we don't fly necessarily right at that instantaneous window. We fly earlier or later. And in fact, where others might have a five-minute window to ISS, we have a 30-minute window. That's important because it's Florida. 
and there's almost always a thunderhead somewhere nearby yeah. and it might be sitting on your path and if you've only got a you know an instantaneous launch window and the you know and the cumulus cloud is on you at that moment you don't get to go that day yeah whenever people like to ask me to, uh, to like if they're going to go and see a rocket launch they ask me like you know how many how should you book the return flight? And my answer is like, one does not book a return flight from a rocket launch. You, you got to give yourself a little margin. Yeah, exactly. So this lets us do launch before or after and do this thing where you kind of steer out of plane. We call it yaw steering, where we fly out of plane and then fly back to that ideal trajectory and then still fly that mission. And that's part of the whole nature of needing to have this parking orbit. Once we're in space, now the Centaur 5 can fly a really long time. A normal commercial mission is a LEO mission. And in fact, interestingly enough, even an interplanetary mission is typically a LEO mission from the standpoint of the rocket. The whole thing for the rocket takes 15, 20, never more than 30 minutes for those kind of missions, even something like Going to Mars, which might be a seven and a half month trip for the spacecraft, was only 20 minutes for us. But there are other trajectories that want more than that. And so that Centaur 5, it can go for 12 hours. It can do all kinds of complex orbital hmm. maneuver at different points in the burn. That's really special, and it allows you to do things you can't do with any kind of a, other kind of upper stage. So, so just to be clear then, like when we see other launches, we see the first stage, the boosters go, and then the boosters come off and the and it goes to the second stage, and it's on this insertion orbit to wherever it is that it's that it's going. But in your case, your expectation is you're going to be launching to low Earth orbit, purely on the boosters and the solid rockets. And then you're going to be able to then have the the upper stage, the Centaur, ready to go. You can do like an in orbit flight check, make sure everything is fine, communicate with the spacecraft, make any modifications to your trajectory, and then fire from orbit and, and make your rendezvous. Basically, we yeah. do use a little bit of propellant on the upper stage to get into that Leo parking orbit. So not purely on the first stage, right. but almost. Right, right. Um, now, you know, the development of the Vulcan has been around for a little while, and you had uh, entertained various levels of reusability. What is the state of reusability for Vulcan today? Yeah, the first place we're going to use reusability is recovering those BE-4 rocket engines. We will be doing that um, a few launches in to Vulcan's initial flights. Not on the first ones, because we got to collect a lot of data. Remember, we fly so high, so fast, so far that um, we need to collect various actual data on those environments that you can't be sure of when you calculate it on the ground in order to then finish the design, finish the NRE and go. But you will see that within X number of flights, I won't say how many, that we'll start conducting experiments. And when we look at reuse, there's kind of two ways to go broadly. You know, you can do what you have seen SpaceX do, which is to propulsively fly the booster back, and then you get the whole value of the booster back, as often as you can afford the propellant to do that. Or you can look at component reuse, which is what we're doing, where we separate the engines. Now, in our particular case, with this architecture optimized around high energy insertions, where we're trying to save all this propellant, we are presented with two challenges if we wanted to fly the booster back. The first is it's harder because it's twice as far down range and really going fast, but also because, well, what's the point in optimizing for these high energy missions and then turning around and saving a third or half of your propellant to fly home with? So it just doesn't make sense for the kind of missions we have optimized for and plan to pursue. Instead, We'll burn all the propellant, we'll separate off the back end. Uh, the architecture is different than what I've described in the past in terms of the recovery. We used to talk about re-entering behind this inflatable heat shield called a HIAD, and then slowing down enough, getting deep in the atmosphere to put out parachutes, and then finally recovering with a helicopter. We've continued to work on this, and now we realize that our giant inflatable heat shield 
is a great raft and we don't have the helicopter anymore. Hmm. We're just going to go ahead and let it descend all the way into the ocean, splash down, float on its raft, and then come and pick it up with a conventional uh, recovery ship. So that saves a lot of cost and a lot of complexity. And for us, recovery is not about you know, vertically landing on Mars and taking off again. It's none of these other objectives. It is really just the economics. And it is far less expensive to develop this type of recovery. And it takes far fewer reuses to make it save money. So it's just all in all a better or lower, I should say, um, economical hurdle. And then that's just the first. I have this list that we have made the most expensive stuff on the rocket kind of in descending order and then you know weighted by how hard it is to get that will be to get it back and we'll start with the engines and we'll start working through that list so that's our plan and the first thing that you will get to see that is a you know sort of directly connected to developing that is on our upcoming jpss2 weather satellite launch where we have a secondary payload that is that inflatable heat shield. Oh, interesting. That's I didn't come know that. Back. Yeah, it won't it won't have the engine. Yeah. So it's it's up in the payload fairing with the primary payload, but it'll have a mass simulator. It's scaled down, you know, it's smaller. And then it will actually do that reentry all the way down to the ocean. It's interesting that idea of using those inflatable reentries. I mean, this has been considered one of the best ideas for how to land on Mars. So, have you been talking with the NASA folks about about helping them with some of their larger payloads? I'm sure there's a lot of 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 work being done there as well. What an insightful question! This is a joint experiment with NASA where we are both collecting the data on the same okay. design of craft, them for a Martian lander, probably a larger scale, and then ourselves, of course, for the engine, a scale kind of in between the Martian lander and, uh, and what this subscale demonstration will be. Yeah, we've been reporting quite a bit on this, on the challenge of landing large payloads on Mars, you know, curiosity, perseverance at the one ton mark is like the limit of what you can do with that parachute propulsive landing combo to get larger, more interesting payloads down there three tons plus. This looks like the next really interesting direction to go if you're, if you're not going to go full propulsive. So it's going to be really interesting to see how that works out. Let's talk about the motors. Now you're using, you've gone with Blue Origin BE4 engines on, on this rocket. How is that, how's that going? Almost done. So we have completed the development of the engines. We have shipped an engine out to Texas to be uh, acceptance tested. So that's coal gas tested, testing followed by a hot firing and then off to the factory to be assembled in. So we are basically there in parallel to that, we'll do formal qualification testing that'll complete before we launch. Qual testing at this point is essentially a formality because we have preceded that with uh, three engines through pre-qualification testing, three different engines, where you do everything you're going to do in qual, plus you do more so that you get a feel for margin and other things that you wouldn't want to do when it, you're, you're testing for score, if you will. So we're, you know, we're at the end, the development is complete. The first flight engines are built, they're being tested. And as soon as they get down to the rocket factory in Decatur, I've got a booster sitting there ready to go. It's all done, it's polished. The fasteners are tightened, the cables have been needed, you know, neatened. There's, you know, the, the kit to install them is on a table. It's all lined up in neat rows and the instant it gets there, they are going onto the back of that rocket. And how does it compare? I mean, you've had experience working with the the RD one hundred and eighties. You've worked with the Aerojet engines. How does this compare in sort of performance, thrust? You know, all of the things that matter from from a rocket scientist point of view. Yeah, the uh, BE fours use the same high performance oxygen rich stage combustion engine cycle that we use on the RD-180. It's a, a it's fundamentally different than a fuel rich kind of cycle 
because you get more energy out of it. You're burning all of the fuel because you're now above the stoichiometric ideal ratio, more oxygen. It also operates at higher pressures as a result, but also higher temperatures and it's more corrosive. And that's the engineering you know, art in making that work. So it's a great engine. It's going to deliver higher ISP. I won't give you the number yet because I, I want for Blue Origin to be able to brag about that when they're finally done and ready to catalog it. But I can tell you, having done four development engines and three prequals and you know now into where we are, that it is higher than I expected. It is excellent performance. The thrust is is very good. I you know we asked them for 1.1 million pounds of thrust out of a pair of engines, so 550 each. I think I'm going to be getting a little bit more than that. So very, very happy with that engine. It is designed to be reused. We've done multiple restarts on a single engine several times. Mm. So we are uh, um, we are way, way past the minimum that we would need to close that business case, that economic case on recovery and reuse in terms of the capability. So it, it's I could not be more pleased with this engine. It also uses methane, which in our case is, will be derived from liquefied natural gas, which makes it domestically sourced propellant that is very inexpensive and very plentiful here inside the U.S. Um, so, I mean, at the same time that you're going to be using the BE-4s, Blue Origin is going to be using them on their on their new Glen, and we've been seeing a lot of holdups and delays in the launching of New Glen. I think at this point we're pushed back to 2023 to even see the first test flight. Um, is are their delays causing any issues in delivering you engines? No, for both of us, the first thing you do is develop the engine. <laughs> yeah, just just to build an engine from scratch, any rocket engine typically takes almost three years, sometimes a little bit longer. When people talk about building rockets really fast, what they're really telling you about is how fast a continuous assembly line of rockets comes out the back door, not how long it took to build an individual part. And so the engine's always the longest thing. We need it, we both need it, and so you know, any schedule associated with their rocket really comes after what we're doing for that engine. And we are the first user. We are really their only major customer at this point, And they are working very, very hard to produce that engine for us. I have, you know, I have no complaints relative to their focus today. They're doing everything they can to get those engines in our hands. And like I said, we've got two built, the first two flight engines built and the, uh, the next couple of pairs, you know, in their factory being processed right now. So how would you reuse those, do you think? How would I reuse what? Use the, the engines, the engines. You talked about how you want to reuse the solid rocket boosters. How... No, no, I was talking about engines the whole time. Oh, okay, okay. Sorry, I thought you were talking about the reuse of the of the solid rocket boosters, but this is the plan for the so, reuse of the, yeah, of the BE-4 solid engines. Solid rocket motor, the reuse case for solid rocket motors is pretty shaky to be honest with you. Most yeah. of the value of a solid rocket motor is in ca mixing, casting, and curing the propellant, which is the thing that gets consumed when right. you fly it. The case is actually not very much of the value. And so recovering the case, taking it home, cleaning it up, and casting again, on shuttle, they never saved any money on the, yeah. on the SRM recoveries. In fact, it cost them. They could have been probably as much as only half the cost if they just made new ones. Not to mention the safety issues. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, so so uh, there's been you know an idea that we reported on a couple of years ago that, that United Launch Alliance has spent a lot of time and energy in thinking about on-orbit refueling, and it hasn't taken off, pardon the pun. Um, where is on-orbit refueling in your sort of mind at this point? Well, it's really tied to ISRU. You know, you, you have three choices on where that propellant came from. You can do it incrementally on a launch by launch basis. In other words, you can launch two rockets so that you can take residual fuel as payload from one rocket and move it to the other rocket that's now dry. That's the least efficient way to do it. 
remember that when a rocket is, you know, I'll say a heavy class rocket is sitting on a, on a pad, only three to 5% of the mass of that whole thing is payload. The rest of it is pretty much all propellant. And so when a rocket flies to space, most of what it lifts is its own propellant. And so a second rocket that is launched to deliver propellant in orbit is not delivering very much propellant. And so that is a very, very inefficient way and will never really likely close on, on an economic basis for well, other than the most specialized of missions. So that's not a, a great way to do it, not a versatile way to do it. The next way is, well, every time you go to space and you have any residual capability on your rocket, you should fill that up with propellant and just incrementally fill a depot someplace. And then over time, you would have a useful amount of propellant to transfer to a subsequent launch. That is more economically viable, but it's a little less predictable and it doesn't allow you to tank up every time, right? You're only tanking up every once in a while. The real key that unlocks all of this is propellant from the moon because that is not in the Earth's gravity well. The moon is a much shallower gravity field or gravity well, if you will. And when we are preparing uh, propellant, liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen from the ice that's present on the moon, now all of this makes a lot of sense. And not only is it economically viable, but it allows us to do things in space that we just practically can't do today at all. So that continues to be our thrust. We continue to work with people who are interested, other companies who are interested in ISRU, in situ resource utilization, to move us in a direction where that becomes a possibility. And by the way, that's one of the reasons why NASA's return to the moon focuses on the polar region where there are you know, vast ice deposits and permanently shadowed craters, because not only is it interesting scientifically, it's interesting for the future use of space. I mean, I mean, I'd love to for you to give me some examples of stuff that maybe you've, you've looked at it and just said, okay, now that's just science fiction, but that's, but that sounds great. Um, but even like well, when I would I'm love to do that, but I don't like to pick on people. And, and some of what I would share with you probably has a startup company and some investor. Cash <laughs> well, but, I, but, but, you know, you say things that can be done that, that you can't do today. I mean, I, I mean, just like this idea of reusability, if you're not having to, if you're not getting anywhere near the earth's gravity field, every rocket becomes a reusable rocket. Yes. Right. And, and in fact, I talked only about engine recovery and other components what I didn't talk about is that Centaur 5 has so much energy and is inherently able to have its, its lifespan extended for very long periods of time that we also think of that as a reusable stage that can go to space, deploy a spacecraft, and then go do other things while it's up there with its tremendous amount of thrust and its tremendous amount of delta V. Um. And when we are able to have propellant sourced from the moon, we unlock a whole different human future. There are such tremendous natural resources on the moon and on the near Earth objects within easy reach of the moon that it will literally change our human destiny. And the only thing we need to unlock that future is this propellant already in space. So give me, give me some examples. Like I'm sure someone on your team has done the math and I would love to hear what the math implies in what's possible. Well, let me talk first about what those resources are and then I'll come back to the math because it turns out I've actually had a team with engineers, scientists, and economists modeling that future, believe it or yes, not. Yes, please. All right, let's definitely talk about so that. So we'll start with what's there. Well, what's there of course is trillions of metric tons of propellant in the form of ice, but also Every year, NASA's ongoing survey finds more near-Earth objects rich with natural resources. And so at latest count, there's about a 1,500 years worth of our planet's entire production of industrial metals sitting there on these bodies, relatively easy to mine if you can actually get there. Because all of the things that are rare here on Earth are only rare because of the way our planet formed because of its large gravity field. In other words, driving those things, those denser materials 
underneath the surface and then only having them come to our accessibility via geological processes. When we talk about a small asteroid, well, it's just laying there. It might be all iron, might be all nickel, uh, precious metals, gold, silver, platinum, more than has been extracted in all of human history is sitting right there. There's a, an object, you know, this half the size of your house that is just platinum. So this is a different future for, for us as a species where we're not just living on a planet with fixed resources, consuming them. You know, it doesn't matter how hard we try to be sustainable. Eventually we run out and our civilization collapses. And we're only talking about when, not if. When we can tap these resources, that's a completely different future. And what is stopping us? What's stopping us is the practicality of going there and getting it when we have to bring the means to get there out of Earth's gravity well, in other words, the propellant. But now that we know the propellant is there on the moon, and in fact, even on these objects, that changes that math entirely, and it makes it practical to have a cis lunar transportation system to go and extract, recover, and bring back, eventually, by the way, not bringing all of it back, but having economic activity that starts and ends in space with manufacturing there heavy industry in space, not on Earth. So when we economically model that, we chose to kind of build on a question that was asked of the last Space Council, which was, hey, is there like one or two things that the government would do to stimulate economic you know, um, development in space? And I said, well, I know just the thing. The only thing I need to make this beautiful human future happen that I just described to you is an industrial scale ice mine on the moon and refinery making propellant. And so we propose this notion of a strategic propellant reserve in space modeled after the strategic propellant reserve or propel, I should say um, fuel reserve that we have in Texas that's been in the news lately because some of that has been released, doing that on the moon for roughly the same kind of resources, what would that stimulate and the first thing it stimulates, of course, is a propellant market. And then as we run that out through our economic model by 2050, just by doing that and doing it in the right way, we forecast a $3 trillion a year brand new economy in space that doesn't exist at all today. It's interesting. I mean, when I think about the need for launch capability today and everyone is very much focused on how to get things from the surface of the earth out into space but once you're gathering your resources in space once you're starting to manufacture some of the large-scale structures trusses solar panels uh landing pads etc out in space the actual amount of stuff that you need to launch from earth starts to decline exactly right yeah and you're thinking of it in the right way it's a journey where we first are taking everything from the earth, we're taking it to the moon, we're building the mine, building the refinery, then we're lifting that propellant out of the moon's much shallower gravity well, placing it perhaps in the near rectilinear halo orbit where gateway would be, probably to geo and earth, that's another place it would be often used, L1 would be another place, and then building that up over time so that because we're able to access these natural resources in these materials, we can begin fabricating in space, not at first, but initially, and then sourcing materials in space so that over time we move from bringing everything from Earth to most of the things actually originating there in space. So, so let's kind of like fast forward, say we're, you know, uh, 20 years from now, 50 years from now, we've got a ice mine on the moon, we've got a propellant capability in various orbits, Lagrange points, etc. How does that change what the future of spaceflight might look like? It means that most of our travel through space is through space, not to space. But we will actually have people, ordinary people like you and me, living and working in space several thousand people to operate all these industries and we will be transiting between the moon the near earth objects the various lagrangian industrial points 
there are things that we can only make effectively in microgravity, like micro tissue construction and certain additive manufacturing techniques for very fine structures. So these whole new industries will appear in space with most of the traffic going between these points. It becomes an extension of the earth in a way. It's like another earth out there in cislunar space. What is a place of the solar system that you would like to have explored more? Is there, has there been like a, you know, normally it comes from a scientific perspective, but is there a target that you would like the challenge from a rocketry perspective? Yeah, I mean, I'll give you two answers. The first is what we were just talking about, you know, un understanding the nature of the propellant on the moon, you know, actually prospecting and mining in the near earth objects, you know, that's that tremendous economic future and, and the thing that changes the destiny of our species. But from a scientific point of view, the gas giants and their amazing moons, which are whole worlds under themselves, are really, really exciting to me. And, you know, some of that is appearing in the latest decadal from NASA that, uh, you know, as prime targets for exploration. And that's something that uh, will really truly be enabled by innovative forms of space travel. It'll be the Vulcan evolved. Mm -hmm. Vulcan is a little bit different than Atlas. I didn't mention that in that you know, we developed Atlas and then we've been flying it and keeping it not obsolete, keeping it current, keeping it reliable. But it's basically the same rocket today in terms of its capabilities that it was at the beginning. That's not the future of Vulcan. Vulcan will continue to evolve, higher performance, different orbits, perhaps third stages, perhaps the implementation of nuclear thermal propulsion to make things like the outer planets accessible in a way that they are not today. Think about it in terms of if you're a researcher, Frazier, you're the guy who is interested in, in one of the moons of one of the great gas giants, and you're going to do research on it, and that research is going to be enabled and culminated in a visit to that object, you will probably be in a rest home by the time the data comes. Yeah. But we can change that if yeah. we have different forms of propulsion and really close up those timelines and greatly accelerate that that research and our understanding of how we fit in this universe. I mean, I think about a mission to back to Neptune, for example, to, to understand Triton. This incredibly fascinating world is going in the wrong direction compared to the rest of the solar system. <laughs> it was the first place that geysers were identified in the solar system by the Voyagers. So exciting. And then you're like, would you like your information by 2040? And you're like, oh. Exactly. What about Venus? <laughs> you know, how about another mission to Mars? It's yes. close, yeah. right? Um, yeah, of course, or, I mean, Venus has its own challenges being oh, literally hell inside yeah. our solar system. And, <laughs> and then I think about like the GMO, the, the GMO mission. I don't know if you remember this. This was the Jupiter Icy Moons orbiter that was going to send a nuclear-powered um, uh, ion engine to the moons of, of Jupiter, which you mentioned, right? That it would be able to go into orbit one after the other. Io, Europa, Callisto, Ganymede, just one after the other. And it would require enormous amounts of Delta V and they'd come up with a way. But I, but I can sort of really see, like if you can deliver more Delta V to the scientists, it opens up possibilities. A fully refueled Centaur upper stage opens up possibilities in, in those kinds of, of missions. Well, we've got a few minutes left. I want to talk about the sort of fully reusable two-stage elephant in the room, um, which is Starship that SpaceX is working on. What do you think are the implications of them pulling it off, of them being successful? Well, that architecture will be tremendously useful to Starlink, for example, which you mentioned a moment ago. We're on Starlink now. That is a really big Leo truck, and a uh, as as its basic architecture, it will take large quantities of Starlinks to orbit and allow um, a faster population of those of those shells. For higher energy orbits, it's not an optimal architecture, and that's why they are talking about refueling. But again, remember what we said: all of that refueling in orbit 
really becomes most attractive when we can source the propellant in orbit. Yeah. And as rockets scale up in size, it's a little bit of a diminishing return in terms of what you can do relative to adding more payload. Because remember, most of what a rocket lifts is its own fuel. So a bigger rocket has more fuel. And so the percentage of that mass sitting on the pad that is payload gets smaller and smaller. So it has great promise, but it, it, it will take time for that infrastructure to be there in order for a vehicle like that to take full advantage of it. Um, now you, uh, you know, the other sort of nation that is uh, building up quite a significant space capability is, is China. And I, you know, as the United States for various rules and regulations, you're not allowed to work with China at all. But, um, you know, I'm Canadian. The rules don't entirely apply to me. But um, what, I guess, you know, you're watching what they're doing. Uh, what, what kind of excites you about the future of, of space exploration from what they're bringing to the table? Well, to be honest with you, what occupies most of my attention relative to China are the tremendous uh, efforts they are placing in the anti-satellite weapons, mm. both in orbit and here on the Earth. And, and this is a tremendous challenge and moment for us as a spacefaring species where all of a sudden now it's pretty clear that not only is there a possibility for a terrestrial conflict to extend into space, but for it to actually start there. And you would probably be surprised at how much of what is going up is directed at that particular mission. And so it's actually pretty disheartening uh, from my standpoint in terms of what the focus is for the Chinese space program. Now, in, you know, in terms of the volume of launches, it's quite impressive. Um, they are not really a player on the, in the commercial marketplace for the rest of the world because they're primary la primarily launching their own stuff. Hmm. It's not about ITAR, it's about capacity. They're very busy putting their own infrastructure in space, but sadly also putting these weapons there. And space is a very unique domain. It's not like air or sea from the standpoint of when conflict happens there. You know, if you, if you sink a ship, it leaves the domain. If you damage an aircraft, again, it leaves the domain. Space is different. Uh, when you damage a spacecraft, it stays in that domain, sometimes for a very long time. And the, the anti-satellite test that was conducted by China years ago, the debris cloud is still growing, believe it or not. Not necessarily because there are more objects magically appearing, but because it is spreading out and more becoming resolvable. It's still there all these years later, threatening, you know, things that are in orbit. And so the prospect of deliberately, you know, propagating a conflict there has the potential of fouling that common high ground for all of us, for everyone, in a unique way that does not happen here on Earth. So that is actually what occupies most of my energy and attention thinking about China. Well, what would make you feel like things are moving in a positive direction? Because it is, you know, there's there's a lot of really interesting research that's going on. As you said, there's a lot of flights going on, there's a lot of learning that's happening. Um, you know, it feels like, you know, maybe I'm just a wide-eyed optimist, but even before the war, or especially before the war, I mean, Space flight is one of these places where humanity can come together, can work together as a team. You see that with the International Space Station, with various missions in the past, the fact that you were flying Russian rocket engines on American-built rockets. It's a, it feels like this is one of those places that's so complicated that working together does have a real benefit. So what would make you feel like, okay, maybe I don't have to be so worried about, about, um, about anti-satellite weapons and more worried about how to figure out a good way to work with them. Yeah, one of two things, either a broad international agreement in recognition of what you just said. This is a uniquely common environment, different than anything on earth. There really aren't borders in space. Spacecraft can't hover over national territory. By definition, they occupy all of, all of the globe, right? They over, orbit the entire earth. And if we could agree 
as an international community that we have as much to lose ourselves as any adversary could be harmed and just not do this and have a regime, a treaty regime around that, that would be wonderfully encouraging in an acknowledgement of what you just described. Or we find a way in the West to make those weapons irrelevant, to make them ineffective so that there's no temptation to use them, one or the other. Mm. Yeah, it sounds... The second one sounds pretty tricky, but well, Tori, we've reached the end of our hour. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today. If people want to follow what you're doing, uh, what's the best place to to keep track of your musings? Sure, two things. Obviously, there's the company website, but follow me on Twitter. You can ask me questions directly. It is me when you see me on Twitter. It's only me. There isn't anybody else who do who does that. I'll share a secret with you. There are very few CEOs who are actually doing their own Twitter. So if you ask me a question, I'll do my best to find it and answer it. And that's a great way to follow me. Um, uh, yeah, I think we'll start Twitter, with that. Sure. Well, it's, it's worked for me. Um, it's been, it's been great corresponding with you on Twitter and I'm really glad that we got a chance to actually finally talk and, and hash some of this stuff out. And, uh, I look forward to all of these projects, especially the ice mine on the moon with the orbital refueling and the missions doing, uh, multiple flybys of, of many moons. I, I am really looking forward to that. So let me know when that happens. Me too. I will. <laughs> all right. That sounds great. All right. Thanks again. Good luck with everything you're doing, and uh, here's to some safe launches with Vulcan. Thank you. It's great talking with you, Frazier. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.